You're the God of miracles. I feel like we could keep singing that over and over. You believe God's the God of miracles? You believe he can still do miracles today? Amen. I believe so too. Well, we are on part two of a brief two-week uh, series called Sermons on the Mat. Everybody say Sermons on the Mat. So we're just looking at two miracles that Jesus performed on individuals who were on mats. And uh, these, uh, these detailed accounts are not just uh, simply descriptive, but they're also deeply instructive. And so what we're learning is, you know, learning lessons from these mat stories and finding out why they matter. Okay. Mark chapter 2 is where I'm at today. Verse 1 through 12 in the NIV. And it says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people had heard he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached a word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, your sins, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this before. Title of today's message is Through the Roof. Tell somebody, let's go through the roof through the roof. Father, someone said, go ahead, Lord. We're going to go ahead. Lord, I'm going to let your word speak for itself. I'm going to let, Lord, your word that is alive and active penetrate the hearts and minds of those that are ready to listen. I pray every ear is ready to hear. Mind's ready to be renewed. Heart is ready to receive. Life is ready to be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Someone say, through the roof. Put your hands together one more time. Let's thank God for miles. We'll see you again here in just a bit. Well, for those that are in the military, or you're married to somebody in the military, or you were in a military family, you know that frequent relocations are a given. Moving is the norm. It's very rare that you're going to stay in the same location for more than three years. And so if you were growing up in a military family like me, you know that uh, we're going to be living in a lot of different places. Uh, My father, as you know, has served 25 years in the United States Marine Corps, and he's been around the world, literally. And so have we. My father was stationed at Clark Air Base in the Philippines where he met and married my mother. Then he received orders to move to Hawaii and aloha, aloha, from Hawaii to California. There they gave birth to my sister. I'm just trying to make it rhyme. Now a party of three, they moved to North Carolina where they had me. We're a party of four, we're out the door. Now we're off to Chicago. From Chicago to Okinawa, Japan, where they had my brother. They weren't expecting him, but it was God's plan. Now a family of five, it was time to go. We left Okinawa and came to San Antonio. Everybody say, San Antonio! Ah! San Antonio. How many of you like me, you say San Antonio is your home? Like this is your city, your home. San Antonio is my home. Yeah, you can put your hands together, it's okay. San Antonio is a great city. You know, it's not just, just our home. It's, it's actually the home of the world champion San Antonio Spurs. Go, Spurs, go. Go, Spurs, go. It's the home of Frostbank. It's the home of USAA and RBFCU and SSFCU. It's the home of Randolph. It's the home of Fort Sam and Lackland. It's the home of Fiesta in Fiesta, Texas. It's the home of the Alamo and the Riverwalk and Valero and Southwest Airlines. It's the home of University Health. It's the home of University of Texas at San Antonio. It's the home of SAC, UIW, Trinity, HEB, Chuck D, Sari Sari, Taco Cabana, La Quinta, La Quintera, North Star, Ingram Park, Edwards Aquifer, and the Edgar Haircut. 
San Antonio is also the home of some great churches like Church's Chicken, Winston Churchill High School, and even some better churches like Cornerstone, CBC, River City, and Harvest City. Amen. San Antonio is also the home to the Clatt family, and technically we're in Cibolo down the street from Bucky's, but we claim San Antonio to be our home, and the reason why it's our home is because we feel like home because Harvest City has made it feel like home. And I hope that's the same that's true for you, because if y'all didn't receive me, then San Antonio wouldn't be home for me. (laughs) I'd probably be out somewhere else, maybe Fiji or something like that, starting a vacation ministry. Does anybody want to join me? Cancun. (laughs) We're going to the Caribbean. Now, I I know some of you here uh, have moved around a lot of places like I have, and, and maybe you've settled on San Antonio being your home. But I want you to consider for a fact that not only can you relate with me, but God can also relate with me because Jesus himself moved around a lot of places. I don't know if you're aware of that, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but shortly after his birth, his family fled to Egypt after King Herod put an attempt on his life, tried to kill him. Now, I've left the city before, but not because someone tried to kill me. Jesus fled And his family fled to go to Egypt. And from Egypt, after King Herod's death, they came back to Israel. And Israel, they then decided to settle in Nazareth, where both Joseph and Mary are from. And that's where Jesus primarily was raised, from a young child all the way up till he's ready for for his ministry. Until one day, he's preaching and teaching in the synagogue, and people are marveling at his words. And someone says, wait a second, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And it says, it says, Jesus responded, says, a prophet's not without honor except for in his own hometown. And he could not do any miracles. He, not that he couldn't do many. He, just, he couldn't do any miracles. Why? Because of lack of belief. And some people were so upset, their anger went through the roof, that they tried to kill Jesus. This time, they tried to throw him off of a cliff. And how many know if this is the second attempt on your life? You know, it's time to go, Right? And Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to die, but not from the cliff. I'm going to die on the cross, so we got to leave. And so Jesus left, and you find that he traveled to Bethany. Then he also went to Jerusalem. And then you'll see he began to settle in a city called Capernaum. Everybody say Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a city on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum became the city where Jesus decided to set up shop. It's where his home base was, his headquarters. This is the epicenter of all of Jesus' public ministry. And here in Capernaum, he was able to do what he could not do in his hometown of Nazareth, and that was perform many miracles. Here in Capernaum, you see that Jesus healed a centurion's servant who was lying paralyzed at home, and Jesus didn't even lay hands on him. The centurion's servant says, Lord, don't even come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to come with me. He says, just say the word, and it will be done. I know what it's like to be under authority because I'm a man of authority. I tell someone to come, they come. I tell them to go, they go. If I tell them to jump, they say, how high? And he says, Lord, just say the word. Jesus said the word, and the man was healed. Jesus healed a royal official son who was near death. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever. We find that Jesus cured a woman who had a 12-year-old blood disorder by her just touching the hem of his robe. And Jesus also raised the life of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. He healed many people who were sick, and he casted out many demons. And there was an instance where it says in Mark 1 where he spoke in the synagogue, and the people were so amazed at his teaching because he spoke as one who had authority. Unlike the religious leaders who were teaching at the day or anybody else they have ever heard before, and because of that, Jesus' ministry went viral. I just want to tell you, he's the first viral person ever to exist in planet Earth. He rapidly gained widespread attention and, 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 pop, and popularity, and the news of him began to spread throughout the whole region, and his popularity reached unprecedented heights. I mean, his popularity literally went through the roof. And we see that in our account because this word spread quickly that Jesus had come back home to his home city of Capernaum. It says a large crowd of people had gathered around Jesus, filling up a house that he was staying at or where he was teaching at to capacity. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us whose home it was. Some believe it be, to be Peter's, and that's all speculation. But whosever house it was, this was a sold-out house. Registration's closed. There's no more room for people. It's jam-packed with them, overflowing with people, so much so that people are spilling out of the house, that there's not even room at the front entrance, not even room around the home. There are so many people that have come gathered to hear Jesus, not just perform miracles, but to to speak, to teach. And who wouldn't want to hear the word, preach the word? Can I amen? 
there was an intense desire for them to not only hear what Jesus had to say, but also to see what he would have them do. And I want to just suggest to you that I, I would love to see the day when every Bible-believing, spirit-filled church would be so jam-packed with people who have a genuine desire uh, to draw near to Jesus. Those with a sincere heart and a full assurance of faith that would worship extravagantly and unapologetically, expressing their love to God, worshiping him for who he is, and praising God for all that he has done. And an atmosphere of revival designed and set up where there's an anticipation for God to do a mighty move. Where you begin to see things like people getting saved and people getting healed and people getting delivered and people getting set free. Lives are being changed, seeing marriages restored, families being strengthened, souls being won. One, disciples being made, the church being equipped, the kingdom being advanced, and God being worshipped. How many would love to see that day? Could you imagine that if Harvest City was completely jam-packed with people? Would you like to see that? No more empty seats. We used to have that campaign. Y'all remember it? No more empty seat campaign. How many would love to see Harvest City Church so jam-packed with people that in the sanctuary we have to remove the chairs and there'd be standing room only? And not only that, the people are trying to press in, but they can't get in because people are wanting to see what God is doing. The Spirit of God, His presence is here, and they want to be able to experience that and have an encounter with Jesus. And they're trying to f file in into the room, but there's no more room, and people are spilling out into the hallways. How many would love to see that? Spilling out into the bathrooms, into the janitorial closet, and spilling out into our front entrance, and spilling out into our parking lot to where there's no room for parking anymore, and spilling out into the streets. How many like that would be the day? I would love to see the day when Harvest City is so, so jam-packed with people that even for us, it'd be so uncomfortable, but there's so many people that want to see and experience the presence of God that I'm okay with being uncomfortable. Is that anybody here this morning? And some of you are like, yeah, it sounds good, but sounds a bit much, Pastor Jonathan. <laughs> like, what? What are we talking about here? Where are we going to park? I mean, we're talking about standing room only. Like, how long are you going to preach? I mean, because I got two bad knees and a bad achy back, you know. And how long is uh, kid check-in going to be? I mean, what's the wait time on that? Man, that's just too many people. Let's just be honest. How many know that's a lot of people? And maybe not something that we would say. I don't know why I was telling my wife, I was giggling and laughing so hard thinking about this this morning, but you're not laughing as hard as I was. But I just thought it's hilarious. You know why? Because there are a lot of people who come at nine o'clock because it's less crowded. They like less crowd, smaller crowds. They like the fact that they can sit down and there's at least two or three seat buffer between them and the next person. Or, or, or even that, if they show up and they get the whole road to themselves, man, that's a good day. But I mean, let's be honest, right? Like, I mean, I mean, who doesn't like space, right? I love, I like space. I mean, I don't know anybody who goes to church or the movies or at HEB, a restaurant or even the emergency room and says to yourself, oh, good, it's crowded. <laughs> Nobody really, really likes, likes crowds. I mean, I was in Bogota, Colombia for a conference some years ago when I was in college. And man, there's about 200,000 people at this conference. And I can tell you, it's the most uncomfortable feeling I've ever had in my life where we were just having to go through security, but trying to pack everybody in a room. And so we're literally walking like this, sh literally shoulder to shoulder with, with somebody next to me. And I could feel somebody's hand right here on the back of my, my leg. It's a little too close for comfort, right? Even in the restrooms, it was always jam-packed where you're just always like this. And for men, the last thing you want to experience uh, in, in, <laughs> in a men's bathroom is the touch of another brother. You know, you're just like, don't. I don't want to touch anybody. And so when we landed, got left Columbia, and then we landed in Houston, man, it was like, wow, space, the final frontier. Like, he had so much space to work with. And man, I just so much appreciated that. And let me just say, crowds are great, you know, um, but we like our space. Can they get amen? amen. So, so Mark actually is talking about crowds a lot, actually. If you read through the book of Mark, get up to chapter 10, and he's already used the word crowds like 40 times before you even get to Mark chapter 10. And the reason why is he's attesting to Jesus's popularity in Capernaum. I mean, it was literally through the roof. Everybody say, through the roof. Now, what I love about that is that Jesus had compassion on these crowds, and he was that accessible that everywhere he went, there were crowds of people. People could find Jesus. You know, some people think that finding God is hard, but it's really not that hard. You know, you know what it's like if you ever play hide and go seek before 
uh, how many are really good at hiding? You know, there's some people who are so good at hiding, like, I mean, you might as well just, you know, go to sleep or something, like, because you're not going to find them. You know, we were playing hide and go seek uh, for, we were at the Pearl, like, uh, a couple few weeks back, and it was Rain Bautista's thir- uh, birthday. Was it 30th birthday? I don't remember what birthday it was. Uh, but it was his birthday, and he wanted to play hide and go seek at the Pearl. And I didn't know if this was like an organized thing, like, like, like you, you book, book a time slot and someone coordinates it. But no, we were going in the public playing hide and go seek like weirdos. And um, so we showed up. And of course, there's like, there was like 30 of us. And so we're looking around and we're like, okay, where am I going to hide? And you're like, man, this is, this is silly. And I just felt silly even playing hide and go seek until they started counting. All right, ready to hide? Ready to go. One, two. And like... <laughs> 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 it was so much fun, though. We had a blast. And I, of course, I got found really quick. You know, Jet has good eyes. And he found me. And I couldn't hide anywhere. And I'm not like the slimmest dude. And so we started finding everybody until we couldn't find one person. And the time limit was up. And we tried to text the brother. We couldn't find. His name was oh, Ishi. He's right there. I can find him today. He's here. Ishi could not be found. We're like, man, he, he either he's the master hide, hide and seeker or, man, he cheated and he went home and he's trying to come back like we couldn't find him. Well, we couldn't find him because he got detained by the police because the police <laughs> thought that he, was, he stole something. But somebody else told me, so this is the rumor that went around that I kept spreading, was that they thought he was going to plant a bomb there at, at, at per, the Pearl. It turns out they just thought he stole something. They detained him for a period of time until he convinced them and had to show proof that you know, we're just playing hide and go seek. He was showing him Rennell's video and his invitation and all that. But that's, that's, that's a whole different story. But if you've ever played hide and go seek with, 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 with uh, your kids before, like they're so easy to find. Am I right? Anybody ever been frustrated playing hide-and-go-seek with your kids? You're like, where are you? You know, there's nowhere my kids can hide in my house that I, not, that I will not find them. My niece is seven years old, and she played with us recently, and I was walking around trying to find her, and I had a bag of candy in my hand, and I opened the bag, and I started eating it, and I'm looking for her, and all of a sudden I hear from the closet, Tito, can I have one? You know, I'm like, oh, there you are. I found you. She's like, okay, good, you find me. Can I have one? Yeah, no, she gave her a piece of candy. But, but here's the thing, that when it's my turn to hide, if it becomes a little too challenging for my kids or my nieces and nephews, I make it noticeable. I'll start making noises <laughs> as I'm hiding in the closet, where I put my foot out and expose it so they can see. And then, of course, they come up to me and say, boom, I found you. I just want to let you know, God is not great at hide and go seek. He... He ain't, Yeshua ain't Ishi. You know, he, he's, the, the, if you seek after God, you're going to find him. This is what it says in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. But from there, you will seek the Lord, your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search me. Search for me with all your heart. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. I just want to say God's desire is for him. Like he desires more to be found by you than your desire of seeking of him. He wants to be found. And it's proof positive of that fact because everywhere he went, Crowds of people were always around Jesus. Why? Because he's easy to find. And so Jesus was always surrounded by crowds of people, testing to his popularity. He had compassion for the crowds, but here's what you got to know about Jesus. He doesn't use crowds as a measure of his success. He loves the person, but he loves, he loves the person more than the crowds, but he loves the people in the crowds. He's not just about the crowds. He's always about individual people. And if you begin to look throughout the Gospels, the single most common attribute of crowds in the Gospel is that they obstruct access to Jesus. Every time there's a crowd, it's mentioned there not to show just Jesus' popularity is increasing, but that it becomes more difficult for people to come and see Jesus. 
So you look at in stories like in Mark 5, the woman with the issue of blood. As y'all know, as Jesus is walking, he's pressed around by, pressed on each side by crowds of people. And this woman is just trying to get healed by Jesus, but she can't get through the crowd. And so she thought to herself, if I would just touch the hem of his robe, then I'll be made well. And she was healed because of her faith. Then you have in Luke chapter 19, we got Zacchaeus where a crowd of people in Jericho were crowded around Jesus. And there is Zacchaeus, a short, wealthy, sinful tax collector, Oompa Loompa-like Lord Farquhar individual, just trying to see Jesus, but he couldn't. Why? Because the crowd prevented him from seeing him because he was so short. But you know what he said? He says, I don't care if I'm short, and I don't care if I look like a fool. I'm going to climb a sycamore tree just so I can see Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, you have blind Bartimaeus. And as Jesus is exiting Jericho, there's a crowd of people that are around Jesus. And once blind Bartimaeus hears Jesus is passing by. He yells out, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowds told blind Bartimaeus to shut his mouth and be quiet. And the more they kept telling him to be quiet, the louder blind Bartimaeus got and said, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and healed blind Bartimaeus, or as I like to call him, Bartimaeus, formerly known as blind Bartimaeus. Now, here's what I want to tell you. You cannot let anybody change your... uh, if. Let me, you cannot let anybody dictate. No, 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 no. You cannot. No, 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 no. You cannot let somebody who can't change your predicament dictate your behavior. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you say, if I got to look like a fool, if I got to get up on a tree, if I got to bend and touch the robe, or if I just got to yell out, Jesus, have son of David, have mercy on me. I'm going to get my miracle and breakthrough. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. And here we find. This house that Jesus is in, again, we don't know whose house it is. This house is crowded. And among the people in the crowd trying to press in to see Jesus is a brother who's been paralyzed, being carried on a mat by four people. Maybe we can even say four friends. And here's what you got to love about these friends is that when they, they can't see Jesus because it's crowded, they've carried this brother some distance to come in Jesus's presence. And it's not like they said, oh, man, full house, registration is sold out. We can't come in. They didn't say that. They didn't say, you know what, let's try again tomorrow. No, they said tomorrow is not an option. We've carried you this far. We're not turning back until you get in Jesus's presence. Now, how many got friends like that who will carry you no matter what? (laughs) How many think you got somebody who can carry you when you can't carry yourself? I'm thankful you got some type of friend who will pray for you when you don't know what words to pray. Or somebody who will strengthen your heart when your heart is already weak. Somebody who will give you a word of encouragement when you lack courage. How many got friends like that? I hope you do. I hope that not only do you have friends like that, I hope you're a friend like that. That you do that for other people. You got a, as what these people begin to do, decide that they're going to tear the roof off the place in order to get their friend in front of Jesus. And some of y'all, y'all need some, y'all need, maybe some of y'all need to upgrade your friend circle to some tear their, tear off the roof type people. Can I get an amen? These are the people who say like, hey, listen, I, I am with you and I'm for you. I'm going to tear off the roof for you if I got to. They're going to go through extraordinary efforts in order for you to be well. These are people who are going to show so much passion and love and compassion and, and, and fervence for you to make sure you get your breakthrough. And I don't know about you, but how many of you are thankful you got friends like that in your life? Friends who will tell you when you say there is no way God can do it, and they'll remind you, hey, God's a may wake, a way maker and he'll make a way in Jesus' name. Sometimes you say, hey, God can't fix that. It's unfixable. But say, hey, God can fix anything. When it seems undoable, God, and they'll remind you, hey, God can do it. When it seems unchangeable, they'll remind you, God can change it. And as Brian was singing today, God can change it. He can change it. Everybody say, he can change it. If it's impossible, you remind them God is the God of impossible. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. So we got these friends who are in a predicament. They don't want to turn back and go home. And so they're coming up with ways in which they can get their friend that's they're carried on a mat to see Jesus. And uh, this is uh, this is this is just all conjecture, by the way, that's not in the Bible. But just go with me for a moment. Uh, I imagine that this man who is just paralyzed on the mat, just sitting there and they're like, well, what are we going to do? It's not like he, he's, he's going to look at me. He's like, well, I can't contribute much. I can't do anything, guys. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to lay here. And his friends are like, OK, well, let's come up with some ideas. One guy's a little stockier guy, and he says, you know what, why don't I, why don't I like a fullback? Why don't I just burst through the crowd and make a lane, open it up, so that way you get direct access to Jesus? And they're like, no, don't do that. You're going to hurt people. Someone says, okay, well, 
What if we like, you ever seen crowd surfing before? What if we just passed you and, and overhead people and just let them just push? And they say, no, don't do that. He, they, they may drop him. Okay, what if we just get really low? And what if we just slide him through <laughs> underneath the legs of everybody? Like, no, they might accidentally step on him. And then one finally says, hey, instead of getting lower, why don't we get a little higher? He says, yeah, if we get higher, then what are we going to do? We're going to tear the roof off the place. How many of y'all got some tear the roof off the place kind of friends? Wild, crazy ideas, but they're going to get you in the presence of Jesus. They can get him in the presence of Jesus. And I like to say, it's like, you know, I don't know if you look at our roof, if any of my friends suggested that, I'm like, no, don't do it. Please don't do it. <laughs> it's kind of high up there. But what choice does he have? These friends are determined. Their faith is active. You can see it. It's visible. They're trying to get their friend in the presence of Jesus. And as just imagine, if you will, because the Bible says they went up there and they started to dig through the roof and imagine debris just falling down on everybody while Jesus is preaching. Imagine while I'm preaching, somebody's digging a hole through that roof. How many know everybody's eyes are going to go? It's, it's, there's going to be a major, massive distraction right there. But what I love about Jesus is not only is he unchangeable, uh, not only is he incorruptible, indestructible, uh, he's also interruptible. Like he's okay with interruptions. And I've had to deal with interruptions while I'm preaching. And let me just say, it can be very distracting. Like, here, here's the number one distraction for me while I'm preaching. And I'm giving, and I'm, I'm really like, man, I'm trying the best I can. Lord, I'm going to preach and deliver this word the way you gave it to me. And as I'm preaching, one of the biggest distractions is when I see a row of people like this. <laughs> Especially when their head starts moving, they're like, I was like, oh, I should just land the plane right now. As y'all know, we did address a few things. There was, uh, we, children are always welcome, as y'all know, that sometimes what they can be doing can be distracting. And, uh, and I'm grateful that our families have accommodated. And there was a stretch where it's just the, the kids were preaching back to me or they were preaching the message, and all of us were looking in this direction. Not that, not that I'm looking at y'all for any reason. It's not y'all. I'm just, this is the area it was at, by the way. <laughs> Uh, there's this pastor who's preaching at this large church, and, uh, and it's large enough where if somebody's saying something, it's going to echo. It's that big. And he's just sharing his heart, and this pastor's honoring another pastor. And as he's honoring this pastor, you just hear in the background, ah! Ah! and he's trying to just ignore it. He's just trying to keep, you know, sharing his heart. And you just hear, oh, hungry, I'm hungry. And as he's preaching, you just hear him go, somebody get that baby a cracker or something. You know, <laughs> he got distracted and he's not interruptible. But I want to say Jesus, Jesus is. And he's not bothered by this interruption. He actually, he says he, he commended them and he saw their faith. And as the brothers being laid, lowered down, you would think that everybody in the room knows what this guy needs. I mean, he's paralyzed on a mat. And as he's being lowered down, it seems like everybody except for Jesus knows what he needs. And he says, not, all right, I see your faith. Rise, take up your mat and walk. Doesn't say that. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And he's probably like, thank you, Jesus. That's my main problem right there. That's what I need right now. It's just you to for." You to forgive my sins. Thank you very much for that, and I appreciate that. He doesn't think that's his problem. See, the thing him and Jesus agree upon, and everybody agrees upon, is that there is a problem. But what they don't agree upon is what the problem is. And what Jesus sees is, yeah, you are paralyzed, that's a problem. But that's not the main problem. Yes, you are suffering, but suffering isn't your main problem. Your main problem is sin. And sometimes we go to God thinking we know what our problem is. When God begins to reveal to us, that's not your problem. Well, yes, Lord, if you would just give me this, I'd be so much happier and better off. Give me that baby. Give me that promotion. Give me that property. Give me some, prosper me, Lord. And we think that is our main problem. 
But Jesus goes much deeper than that. Because he knows if he can fix that, it won't fix you. And he wants to not just fix the problem, he wants to make you whole. And so he says, son, your sins are forgiven. You know, it's always difficult when you think you know, but then you realize you don't really know. It's humbling. You know, we were at, uh, we've had some things go, you know, minor things happen in our house. And uh, one of the things that happened was our lights in our master bedroom went out. And I thought the issue was just change out the, the two, you know, light bulbs, the tubes. And so I bought new light bulbs and I changed it out and the light wouldn't turn on. I couldn't figure out what in the world's going on. I thought that was the problem. And so for about a week, to, I'm not a handyman, by the way. I can do some things, but if there's not a YouTube video for this, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to need some help. Um, but we were like using our phone and flashlight. I mean, it looked like we were robbing somebody. We're like in, in the dark in our closet. I mean, there's no windows or anything like that. And uh, until one day, somebody told me the issue is probably your ballast. And I said, what's a ballast? And I've never heard of that in my life. What the heck is a ballast? And so I removed the tubes, and then I had a cover there. I took off the cover, and there's the ballast. And I ended up changing the ballast, put back on the cover, put on new lights. Now the lights work. In fact, before I turn it on, I said, let there be light. And it worked. There's things like that in our life where we think just changing out those two bulbs, that's going to fix everything. And you realize this doesn't fix anything. You know, um, one of the most humbling things is if you think you know what God is going to say before you even ask him, and he tells you something different. That's so humbling, especially when it catches you off guard. So we were at this conference, or excuse me, a meeting, it's a pastor's meeting, about 40 of us are there, and the pastor is, a, is very prophetic, and he wanted to lay hands on every pastor and speak a, a, a timely word, a now word from God. And for me, you know, I always pray. I say, Lord, give me wisdom to lead your church. And uh, if I'm not doing something right, Lord, tell me. But give me strategy, God. What am I supposed to do right now? And I kind of have in mind, this is like what I need to do. And so as pa the pastor is laying hands on other pastors and he's giving them a word, he's going to one of them. And everybody has similar words. He's like, it's all encouraging. He says, brother, I could see the Lord says he's, you're a man of excellence. Because you're a man of excellence, you can be a man of excellence, no matter if it's little or small, and God's going to increase you. And he goes, I can see that you're a man of character and integrity. God's going to multiply that, use you as a model, and he's going to replicate that across not just your city, but all, all across the globe. And then he said, you, you have an anointing. You have an apostolic anointing on you. And everybody's got great words. And he's about to come to me and my wife. And I'm like so excited. I'm like, oh, okay, what, what is he going to say about me? And, it's, and, and everybody, we were like one of the last ones to get prayed for. Everybody's got something real good and positive. And then he gets to me, looks at me, puts his hand on me. And I got my eyes closed. And he says, quit neglecting your children. I'm like, huh? <laughs> what? And I'm looking at everybody like, I'm really a good father, by the way. Like, like I am not... I'm in, active and involved. I'm like LeVar Ball, by the way. Like, I am very, very much involved in my kid's life. But he says, quit neglecting your children. And we just sit and we just listen as he was speaking over us. And he said, and not just your children, the children the Lord entrusts you. Children's ministry, youth ministry, don't neglect them. And he says, and if you don't, he says, this is what you need to do. Recruit and find people who are passionate about the next generation and develop them and build them up. And if you do, the Lord is going to bring a lot of young people your way. And we're starting to see that now, by the way. Young people your way that you're going to equip and send out like you'll be like an institution, a school, mobilizing these young people to go and advance God's kingdom throughout the world. And I believe that and I received that. I wasn't expecting that, especially when I had to go back to my table and all of them, I feel like they're judging me, looking at me weird, like, I'm, hey, man, I'm, hey, did I, I was like, did I show you my kid's game? Like, I went to, like, <laughs> let me show you. He scored five points. Isn't that awesome? Wow. But, but, but the thing about that is as soon as we got back, it was like a word in season. And so my wife and I uh, found and worked with some people in our church who are passionate about the children's ministry and the youth ministry specifically. We worked with the youth for the last a uh, year and a half until we had Isaiah and LJ step in uh, as interim youth directors. And we have such a phenomenal 
children's. I mean, if you went to the VBS this Sunday, we have a phenomenal team that cares about your children. We have a phenomenal team that cares about our youth. And we are going to have, always have, by God's grace, a legacy, that care, a legacy, a church that builds on and equips young people. All of us who are in ministry right now, we're part of our youth ministry and children's ministry here because we invest in our young people. And somewhere along the way, I lost sight of that. The problem isn't strategy. The problem is my eyes were off the youth. God sometimes will tell you some things that you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. And sometimes they can be, well, you think it's this, but it's actually this. You, you think you, the issue is your spouse, but the Lord's like, no, the issue is you. She needs to honor me. No, you need to love her, vice versa. Some of you are laughing. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> God told him to say that to you. Yeah. <laughs> But sometimes we think what we, we need is going to help us, but God knows what we need. Even before we ask him, he's already got it. So he tells this brother, it's not your suffering that's the issue, it's your sin. And he says, son, your, sin, your sins are forgiven. Now, what's interesting is that the Bible says that we are supposed to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means to just change your mind. It's not, it's not, it's not, more, it's not, it's not a, a motion you feel, it's a decision you make. You change your mind about God and about what you're doing, and you turn back to the Lord. And as he's being lowered, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. But nowhere do we hear that this man asked for his sins to be forgiven. Nowhere do we see that there is any indication that he is repenting of his sin, because in order for you to be forgiven, there must be repentance. But could it be possible, and I want you to know this, is that uh, there are things that we have in our heart that we don't say that God knows. There are some, sometimes we have inarticulate desires in our heart that we don't verbally communicate, but God knows what's in our heart. There's some people who, you know, if you were to affirm your spouse in front of everybody, like in your heart, you have so much love for them, but out of your mouth, it's like, uh, I love you, and you know, I've just been loving you for like love is love and, you know, you're love and I'm love and, you know, and we love each other. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, man, you should have worked on that speech, brother. But there's something in your heart, but even that God can get into. And could it be possible that there is enough desire in his heart for repentance that God could see that? And this is why I'm suggesting that is I just want to let you know God's grace is, is aggressive. Like, it's not like he's coming down. And he's saying, Lord, please, Lord. Lord, I beg of you, me Lord. Please forgive me of my sins. I'm a wreck. Didn't say that. Some of us would go to God like that. Lord, please, would you look upon your humble servant? And please, I beg of you, me Lord. Just a spare change, please, Lord. Please meet my needs, Lord. Lord, God, please. We beg God. You don't need to beg God. His grace is aggressive. You know how aggressive his grace is? Y'all remember the prodigal son when he was in the pig pen and it says he came to his senses? That's another expression of him repenting. He says, man, I'm hungry right now and I'm about to eat the pig's, pig's food. But back at home, even my servants are, eating, servants are eating better than this. And it says he picked up himself and started walking back home, rehearsing his forgiveness speech or asking for forgiveness. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He said, no, that's aggressive. Father, please, please, Lord, please, my Lord, please forgive me. He didn't, he started rehearsing. And before he can even get a word out, the father sees him coming. And just by him coming, the father goes quickly and embraces him. And the Bible says he kisses him on the neck. But if you look in the Greek, it means profusely kissing him on the neck, meaning he's like, mm, 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 mm. he's smothering this guy who just wasted away his inheritance. And then he says, father, I've sinned against. He goes, He hugs and he embraces him. He says, quick, somebody get him a robe. Someone put sandals on his feet, ring on his finger, and kill the fatted calf. For the son of mine who was once, once lost and dead is now found and alive. And why, 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 why would he do that? Because grace is aggressive. He wants to lavishly pour out his grace on you. You don't deserve it, 
but he gives it to you. Some people forget that. You don't deserve it, but he lavishly, willingly pours it out on you. You know, it's like, it's like some people think you got to get right before you got to get with God. It's kind of like those people who, who uh, don't see the doctor until they get better. Like, I mean, I, my doctor is here, Dr. Dinah, and there's some, some appointments I should have, but I'm waiting for me to drop 10 pounds before I see her. <laughs> so, some of y'all need to see your doctor, <laughs> by the way. But some of y'all just need to come to Jesus. His grace is always sufficient. In fact, in fact, let me, let me I just put it a, a good way. You can never out God's grace. No matter how, how wrong, bad you are, grace will always embrace. God loves you so much. Grace will find you as you are, but won't keep you as he found you. He finds you. He will change you. Grace fuels the whole thing. And even as this guy is being lowered down, he says, your sins are forgiven. Even though he didn't say anything, but in his heart, God, see, God knows what's in your heart. And he says, and he says, your son, your sins have been forgiven. And, and here's the wild thing about that. There's a, there's a, another group of people that are there. Not everybody in the crowd is for Jesus and with Jesus. Some are critiquing Jesus. It's the Pharisees. Oh, I think I got him here. He messed up that one. No, no, no. <laughs> Anybody doing that to me today? You're like critiquing my sermon. You're like, let me see your notes afterwards, by the way. We'll compare, share. Okay. But, but, but in the, they didn't even say anything. These Pharisees, the religious leaders, they didn't even say anything. And Jesus, without them even opening their mouth, Jesus heard their hearts. He knew what's in there. But again, Jesus can hear your heart. Jesus heard their hearts, and he began to address their heart. Because this is what they said. This is blasphemy. Who alone but God can forgive sins? Who does this fellow think he is? And then Jesus, hear their thoughts, just looked at them. By the way, have you ever heard, I mean, the closest we have to that, if we're married, are our wives. They can hear our thoughts. You're thinking something, and they turn around, and they look at you like, you're like, How did, get out of my head, get out of my head, <laughs> you know. Jesus, just imagine you're saying something about Jesus, and he just turns and looks at you and addresses it. And he says, and he asks him a question, what's easier for me to say, get up, take up your mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven? Which one's easier? And nobody answers, because they don't know. And Jesus said, fine, take up your mat and walk. Two things. Why is this blasphemy? Well, imagine this, right? He's forgiving this guy. But ima imagine this, uh, in this true story. When I was a youth pastor, my first time leading the youth to a, a con at a conference, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, some of the young men were outside throwing the football. And you know... After some time, you don't like throwing the football so close, you spread out. And we were just throwing bombs at each other, just kept throwing it. Well, our founding pastors decided to join us on this conference. And you, if you guys know Pastor Rose, Pastor Rose is about five, five feet. Is she taller than you, D? She's about five feet, right? You're about five feet? Okay. She's, you're shorter than her. She's shorter. Okay, we'll, we'll see that when she comes back next week, if you're right. You hear that, Pastor Rose? I know you're watching. D says you're shorter than her. Let's fact check that next week. So she's walking, and you know Pastor Rose is very, very petite um, and very tender. And as she was walking, somebody threw the football, and it line drives, hit her in the side of her head. And her head bounced back like this, and Pastor Joe caught her like she got slain in the spirit. And then Pastor Joe picked her up, and we all just stopped. And the, the young man who threw the ball took off running. <laughs> he did, he did, he actually took off running to hide. And Pastor Joe looked at Pastor Rose and made sure she was okay. And, you know, you know, Pastor Joe, he's, you know, Pastor Joe's aggressive with his love, too. You ever been greeted by Pastor Joe? He hugs you. He's like, hey, brother. <laughs> and then you give him your hand. He shakes your hand. It's like this. You're like, whoa, I didn't know that jiggled right there. It's like, whoa. He's aggressive. He took Pastor Rose by the hand. He said, who, 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 who threw that football? And then a young man named DJ came forward and says, Pastor Joe, I'm sorry, it was me. And then he grabs Pastor Rose and she's kind of like following Pastor Joe. He goes, okay, now, Pastor Rose, say you forgive him. She says, Anak, I forgive you. And then the young man said, oh, thank you so much. And then they went back and they iced her head. Now, it would be different if Pastor Joe left her there and says, you know what? Who, who threw the ball? 
DJ, come here. I want to tell you, I forgive you. Now, could he do that? He can't because he's not the one that was offended and hurt. The one who was offended has to be the one to say, I forgive you. I release you. I, if someone hurts you, I can't say to them, you know what? Uh, I know you hurt Sister Sandra, but I forgive you. She has to do it. That's why they had a problem. Who alone but God can forgive sins? And Jesus says, I forgive you. In other words, what is he saying? I'm God. They said, their anger went through the roof. What? <laughs> Blasphemy! Who is this fellow think he is? And Jesus, hearing their thoughts, says, what's easier for me to say, pick up your mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven? And he tells them, pick up his mat and walk. And walk. Now, now nobody knows, like, it's speculation. What's, what's harder for Jesus to say, you're forgiven or you're healed? Which one? Here, here's his bottom line. Nothing's too hard for him. He can do both. Forgive you and he can heal you. But if we really look at it, Jesus all has to say is a word, you're healed. That's it. He gets up and walk. But for Jesus to say you're forgiven, he's got to die. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So when he tells this man who's lame, he says, you want your, you want your legs to be mobilized? Then I'm going to have to put my legs in an immobile position on the cross and be nailed to the cross for you. If you want to get up and dance, that means I got to get down and die. That's why we sing, you know, um, I was just singing this all morning and um, trying to find a better way to say it, but I was just over, overwhelmed by God's grace and his love for me. <clears throat> and it was that, you know, a song, we, it, we sing it, what can wash Away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow, no other fountain of nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed with that. You know, the things that you go through in life and you're like, Lord, I'm not perfect but your blood is enough. When I am, my sins are as red as scarlet, you make it white as snow. You died for me so I can rise again. You rose for me so we can rise with him. Mm. You know, this is what he tells the man. He tells him to pick up your mat and walk. Why is that? Well, don't leave anything there. Bobby. It's not your house. <laughs> That was mad as symbolic. That thing used to carry you, now you're carrying it. You used to lay on that mat, but Jesus got you up off of it. Everybody should have something that reminds you of what Jesus has done for you. You know what we call that? Communion. We're going to receive that together here in just a moment. Communion reminds us of what Jesus Christ has done for us. I have some things that are, are personal things that I keep with me. Uh, it's in a special box, and it's, it's of no value other than what it's, it's, it's significance to me, it's sen sentimental. I have this bright neon green entrance bracelet to a youth camp that I went to where I really surrendered my life to the Lord. I keep that because at that conference is the first time I sensed and felt God's presence. First time I ever got slain in the spirit. It's the first time me and my sister ever embraced and hugged and kissed each other on the cheek. It was a holy kiss, friendly, lovely family kiss where we became best friends again. I have another bracelet um, that I got at a conference called the One More Soul Conference. And I kept my name badge too, because that was when I submitted to the call of God on my life. And I keep those things as reminders, because sometimes we have uh, amnesia, forget what God has said to us and what God has done for us. And I keep those things to remind me of what God has done for me, what I have agreed to do for God, because of what he's done for me. 
We all have those things. And so this guy, when he looks at the mat, he's probably like, man, I can't remember. I can't believe my four friends. They're crazy. Man, it was some tear the roof off friends, man. I can't believe I got those four friends who carried me on that mat. And I remember I was like, I thought it was a crazy idea to put me up on the roof. And when they started to tear the roof off the place, I just remember I was like, I can't believe I'm going through the roof right now. And as I'm coming through, I can't believe Jesus said, your son, sin, son your sins are forgiven. And I thought, I thought that was it. He was just going to forgive me my sins. But no, he told me to get up and walk and I got healed. And man, I can't, remember. I can't believe Jesus did that. You know, there's one more person in this story um, who didn't get their, an answer to their question. It was the homeowner. It's not in the Bible, but I'm just, I'm just saying. I bet you right now he's looking up at that hole in the roof. And he's wondering, he says, Lord, who's going to fix this roof? <laughs> and then we would just tell him, you know what? God can fix that too. God can fix that too. I said it twice because Miss Mishu coughed. God can fix that too. You need forgiveness of sins, God can do that. You need healing, God can do that too. You got a roof that needs repaired, God could do that too. I should have titled the message, God can do it too. Tell your neighbor, God can do that too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, we're, we're, we, we are just overwhelmed by your great love for us. Your grace is, is so aggressive. That just like in the story of the prodigal son, you didn't love the son because he repented. The boy could repent because he was loved. And we can repent because we're loved by you. And so, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are here who have some issues. They're really suffering. I pray, Lord God, that you'd meet them at their need. But you would reveal to them what their greater need is. And if those are here today who have not made you Lord of their life, surrender themselves to you. The best thing they can do is not get up and walk and have their needs met, but to be in right standing in relationship and fellowship with you. To surrender their hearts and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are already part of the family of God. But we know throughout life, we get, things get messy and we fall short. And we mess up, make mistakes, and we sin. And I pray that today you remind them that your grace is sufficient, that your blood still washes over them, that they're still part of the family of God. They're still your son. They're still your daughter. They just need to get cleaned up. And Lord, coming to you is the right thing to do. For you said that if we confess our sins, you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, today we just say, Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us, Lord, where we've offended you. Forgive us, Lord, where we've hurt somebody else that we care about deeply. Forgive us if we felt like we've abandoned our families, that we've, our love has gone, grown cold toward you and toward others. We ask, Lord, that you just touch our heart. Make us new. Wash us clean. Thank you, Father. You're so good to us. Lord, I ask that you just begin to minister to my brothers and sisters who need a word from you. Those who need healing from you. Pray that you meet them at their need. It's none of this or that, so this and that. You can do that, and you can do that, and you can do that, and you can do that. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.